Oh, God. Mm-hmm. So did I. Because I tapped out for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. To be honest with you. So they did uh, 666,000. Six. That's it? That's it. Okay. And they're stuck in the mud. What, what, what did they do last week? Oh, last week, you know? 523. Remember oh, last week was on the different. Oh, that's right. They went up against Hedda Higgins NXT. Right. Oh, so, <laughs> so their minds, they went up 137,000 viewers. Yeah, up, up 27%. Yeah, right. So the show starts out with. No recap, no nothing, just you know, legit. Ring entrances, Cage comes out with his crew. The, the announcers aren't really explaining the storyline here. They're just they're coming out for the match. There's a lot of, like, there's entrances, and the announcers aren't doing a lot of talking here because I don't, you know, they should be explaining why all these people are fighting each other, what's going on with them. But they didn't do a very good job of this. And this was the first match where the referee looked like an imbecile. Okay, because he got distracted by Mother Wayne, but the way he was positioned himself was like he looked like he was intentionally trying not to see what was going on behind him. And Sabian hit, hit Juice Robinson with Chris's contract case, and Paige hit the dead eye on him and then pinned him. So, you know, and then, then Juice and Christian are not very happy with each other after the match, but Powell's POV, a decent match with yet another finish that did more to make the referee look bad than it did to put heat on the heels, which is absolutely correct. The referees is. The referees are not good actors on the show. They're, no. they're, te- they're, they're atrocious. Yeah. They, they don't know how to work. They don't know how to work it to make it look like they're, you know, they're so <laughs> bad. And then, like, like trying to show that they're getting duped out there. That they're, they're, It's like it's this very bad acting. Right. It's, it's unbelievable. There's a guy, have you, maybe you saw him on Twitter or something like that. He does follow the camera on our Twitter. Do you know who Brian R. Solomon is? No. He's like a writer and author. He does a, a podcast. Wait, know. Brian Solomon? I think the name is familiar. Yeah, his podcast is called Shut Up and Wrestle. He's going to have Meltzer on next month. And I'm not trying to plug him. I'm just, this is a tweet that he had. He was at the show last night. And this is more, I know he just started, this is more overall, but he said, this was just not a good show at all. The main event got the crowd going a bit, but for the most part, the fans were disinterested, yelling and chanting over promos and sitting on their hands during the match. It was hard to follow as a live spectator, and Tony Khan was booed. So the live crowd. Oh, I read that. I actually did read that. I think maybe yeah. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to the thing later on where with Moxley gets shouted down too. So yeah. that was kind of they're getting rambunctious. They're getting restless. Well, well, there's nobody there, and the shows aren't that good. Yeah. So, so Renee Paquette was speaking with Mercedes Monet while Camille stood by. They're, they're doing the same thing they do with every other smaller character, bigger character, where the Monet's bossing Camille around, making her look like a schmuck. It's really uh, uh, this is not working with them. So Piquet brought up the failed attempt to hit Chris Statlin over the car. Monet complained about Camille's driving and ordered her to take her jacket in the lock and said she's not afraid of Statlin, but Statlin was down the hall behind her. And then Monet ran away when she spotted her. Camille came out of the dressing room and was run into a wall by Statlin. Then Monet went after Statlin who picked her up. Then Camille pulled Monet down and when Statlin her spirit through a wall. And Camille was in a, her shoulder was in a sling too. So, so the, yeah, this is all. They, they, they did the same spot where they went through the drywall. Like, you know, that they did with the Samoa Joe was supposed to be out for like, like months with yeah. an injury. So I thought, yeah. <laughs> the, the Monet and Camille's shtick here is just not good. You know, I don't know. Tony Giovanni introduced Osprey, and Giovanni spoke about Takesha stealing the international championship from him and asked about Kyle Fletcher's antics. Osprey dismissed Giovanni, so he could call out Fletcher. Fletcher came out and said the family's never far. Fletcher stood the family there from behind for they would send Osprey home for a long time if he laid a finger on it. And Osprey assumed that Fletcher brought out a screwdriver with him, and he, he did. He pulled the screwdriver out and threw it on the, the, in the ring. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Osprey's talked about his, his past with Fletcher. He said Fletcher knows everything about him, including where he lives and where his son goes to school. He said Osprey gave him a place to stay and fed him when he needed it, but he keeps Osprey doing that for himself. Fletcher said Osprey wanted to mold him into an Osprey clone so they would do this dirty work and would never be successful. And Fletcher called Osprey a selfish hypocrite. Osprey told Fletcher to decide whether whether he's nothing like him or a clone. Osprey asked Fletcher what he's done and emphasized that he didn't mean what he, he and Mark Davis did together. And Fletcher says about what he's going to do. He said it was past Osprey and he wants to prove, prove it at AEW full gear. Then Osprey said Fletcher wanted a pay-per-view match is what this is all about, and Osprey accepted the match. And Fletcher said that if Osprey thought the tiger driver, the screwdriver, the back of the head were bad, he's not coming for pieces time, he's coming for everything. And he and Osprey actually told a story in this about how his his left arm is getting weaker. And I don't know if that was storyline or real, but it was just like I, I don't know why he would say that. You know, like that's if it was real, yeah. Like you don't you'll bring that up. And if it is if if it's if it's still a work, it's like you wouldn't in a storyline, tell your opponent that you're hurt. 
before right. the match starts. Like, that, yeah. I don't. I didn't get. I didn't. You know. That's a mistake, but they'll probably play into it. I, and exactly, you're right. Now the guy's going to go after it in the match, and they'll go, hey, remember when Osprey? Oh, he's having problems with his arm, and, you know, Fletcher's going to go after it and all that. But, yeah, because he said, he said it was from the Tiger Driver, and yeah. it's, so I'm it, was, it, was, it was a work. But uh, but the only problem with uh, this is all right, but but Osprey comes out, of, he just does not dress like a star at all. I mean, and he just always wears jump, you know, workout clothes, and he just doesn't look look like anything special when he's out there doing doing these promos, you know, at all. That's that's my criticism. I don't know why he doesn't dress nicer. But um, so I mean, here's some of the mis like the AEW audience. You know, we've talked about it. Here's this guy, Sal Brian Solomon, says the Fletcher Osprey segment was just terrible, like a bad high school play, and I think a significant portion of fans had no idea who Davis was or what his connection to Fletcher even is. Well, let me try to finish the rest of the segment. I'm okay. just going over that promo. So then Brian Cage and Lance Archer entered the ring, and Osprey said he had friends too, and Hobbs and Mark Davis came in. Mark Davis was dressed like a goof again. Yeah, 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 we played this that. Guy. Yeah. So Osprey was censored, and then they fought. And Fletcher and Davis backed into one another, but didn't get physical. The strong music he played. So they, they, they went from one segment right to the next one because Archer went to the stage and waited for him. But they came out to the tunnel, and I didn't i didn't know they were having a Falls Count Anywhere match because I don't follow their, cause their social media blocks me. They do okay, so I can't stop. Like, you know, so, so they were supposed to have a Falls Count Anywhere, but this is another one of the three matches that the MGF is supposed to the win to fight MGF or whatever. But that's, so they, like, that's like a major movie studio blocking a critic who doesn't like all their movies. Right. And that's so it was, you know, this was, it was just so funny. Because this is a production error. Oh, do you get the do you get the quarter hours? Quarter? Yeah, they're not. Oh, they're not. So they got the so they fought in the back. Okay, because the falls kind of anywhere. Oh wait, <laughs> here they are. They, they just it, it, it wasn't lit up, so it was dark. And in the dark, they did a a, a choke slam through a table huh. and, and a false finish that you couldn't see because it was too dark. Okay. Right, right. So then, they, then after all that spot, somebody came, somebody decided it would be a good idea to, to shine a light on everything so everybody could see what's going on. That, yeah. that was hysterical. Uh, so, so Brian Cage showed up and attacked Strong in the crowd. And Archer and Cage stood up for the finish of the wait until Matt Taven and Mike Bennett stood, showed up to save Strong. And Archer stood on a table, set up for choke slam. The group of security guards showed up, and Archer choke slammed Taven onto the security guards. But then. Strong battle back and hit a knee strike off a barricade and pinned Archer on the floor. So this new big tag team of Lance, Lance Archer, Brian Cage is already doing jobs. You guys are weighing about 100 pounds less. Than this is sure. I don't. This is so. This is so silly. I, so didn't, they know, go to, I, I didn't know that result. That's unbelievable. Because I was. No. Like, well, why is it unbelievable? Because uh, they had them. They made a big deal about them getting together. I thought maybe they're going to do something with them. And I was even going to say a little, a little late, but glad to. See. Now I find out they're not even doing it. They're already losing. But that's the MO. Yeah, so so the show MJF is smirking as he watched and a strong end of the ring he got on the mic and said he would finish MJF in full gear. Then this segment went into another segment. This is all just one continuous segment because Takesh attacks Strong from behind. So Cole comes out for his entrance for his match against Takesh. <laughs> and so they, <laughs> so I don't know, like, I've always talked about like you know what like Russo said you want to book the show like like somebody is has a channel changer. Yes. You know like the, the, the memories are so uh, I can see the, the the philosophy here, but this was just like all, all comes it just all of this came across very convoluted, right? So so they did a thing where Takesha put the dice. So Takesha rolls out of the ring, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he's setting him up for the, for the, the knee pad thing where, where Cole pulls the Not knee the pad down. And Cole's a ridiculous um, thigh slapper, too. Four, but I gotta get he's kicking guys in the here. stomach and slapping his side. Like, this, this is. I, I don't know. I, I, I think, it, I think one, of, one of these guys did kick the guy in the. slapped his thigh. Like, you, like you're gonna make that sound when you kick somebody in the balls. Think how stupid that is. So to catch a roll out of the ring and just having to roll out of the ring at the spot where the diamond ring was, the referee tried to block Cole from approaching to catch it. So here's what Cole did. Cole just put, shoved the referee aside. The referee took off and walked to the far corner of the ring with his back to all the action, looking around past the corner, like on the floor for stuff and while Takesha hit him with the, with the ring behind the referee's back and the referee turned around and counted one, two, three. Yeah, whoops. It was just another pathetic looking performance by the referee that made it, that made him look so, I mean, I don't know, you know, they should do a gimmick here where somebody just starts calling out the officiating, you know? Yeah, well, JR used to, but it was like, 
it was almost at the ex- well you don't want to tell the audience the refs are screwing up really i mean it's so obvious that a lot of people see it but yeah they should have a character going you know what are you doing there's oh, also well so, so here's to, to, so let me yeah, yeah. The, the segment's still going on okay so they go to mgf on the on the screen and he's laughing he's, he's laughing so he said there would not be a three-way match due to Cole's loss. So so literally now the pay-per-view match is MJF versus Roderick Strong. So then Strong ran in and was kicked by Takeshita. Oh, that's what it was. Takeshita hit him with the, with the kicked him, also slapped his thigh. Yeah. Okay, so then Kyle ran, R- Riley ran out with the chair, causing Takeshita to leave the ring. Then Takeshita went to the stage and played the crowd. Then Ricochet came out and Takeshita. <laughs> then Ricochet picked up the AW International Championship and Takeshita left behind. And in the ring... We had Cole, O'Reilly, and Roddy all in there together, like the old and undisputed yeah, yeah. kingdom yeah. era, whatever they call it. And Cole offered O'Reilly a handshake, but he got, he said no. He opted to leave the ring instead. All right, let me read your pal's paper POV on this. The match is enjoyable till the awful finish. It's bad enough that they keep making the referees look bad at these finishes, but this one wasn't even logical unless the referees turned to keel. Seriously, there's just no reason for the referee to keep his back turned as long as he did. Meanwhile, MGF vs. Strong is less appealing than MGF vs. Cole or even the three-way. Finally, I still couldn't care less about the never-ending drama involving the current and former Undisputed Kingdom members. They've been doing this in three companies now. Move on. I kind of agree with that. You know what's funny? I was listening to Alvarez's clip on YouTube with him and Dave, and they were talking about how great the, the Fletcher Osprey segment was and how great how, the, how Fletcher had a lot of heat. Nacho was really over it. I'm like, well, what were you guys listening to? The, the crowd was dead. That, that crowd was empty. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I said that, that guy Solomon was talking about how, the, you know, the Davis guy got no reaction. And underneath, an AEW fan said, well, that's on the fans, isn't it? And Solomon was like, no, they're under no obligation to know who somebody is. They're there to have a sign. You have to tell them. Yeah. The, 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 the observer community and the AEW fan base is trying to turn wrestling fans into, into utter morons. You know? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. It's their fault. No, not really. So the Death Riders, which is Moxie's group. They came in a pickup truck. So this is supposed to be the big TBS takeover, right? Yeah. Let's see. So, so they all got out. They met up with Claudio and Wheeler. The world were, some of them were white tank tops. So they looked like uh, whatever. Then Renee Paquette uh, interviewed uh, Lashley, MVP, and Benjamin. And Paquette tried to talk, tried to ask Lashley if he felt prepared to face Swerve. But MVP interrupted and reframed the question to put over Lashley. Lashley said Swerve is dangerous to everyone else, but he'll make an example out of him. And Lashley said it will hurt Swerve. MVP says Swerve will be in action later in the show and they will be watching. Now, now mind you, Kate, for what they're doing later, Swerve is wrestling Lashley, who's a bigger guy. He's, he's supposed to, like, you know, they, they we're supposed to provide, like, you know, a menacing opposition to him, especially the guys like a, like a shoot fighter, too, right? Yeah. So that's, right. So just yeah, not, not remember, not the, let's remember that. Let's remember that. So Claudio Wheeler, you know, for some reason, brought out J.D. Jake who made him the chair. He was supposed to be there. He was supposed to compete with him. And it's like, yeah. I spoke about Chuck Taylor eating through a straw because Orange Cassie couldn't save me. Also, said Cassie couldn't save Yuta. Oh, by the way, their big TBS takeovers that they grabbed the cameraman. Moxley said he would turn Cassie into a hamburger meat. He said all the potential contenders will see it and will run and hide. And it says group will continue to do their thing because they have the power. Orange Cassie came out and he was with Mark Briscoe and Rocky Romero. This is the conglomeration. Is this the conglomeration? I think, the, yeah, that's part of the conglomeration. And then they do not look menacing at all. Like, like those three standing there was not a good look. Uh, Cassie said he agrees with Moxley, believes when he says all the things he to do. And Cassie spoke about how the AW World Championship represents the wrestlers, the people, and everything that pro wrestling can be. Cassie said they could fight all over the building, but the only way to become world champions is to wrestle. And Cassie said he's pretty good at wrestling and called beating Moxley. Cassie said he and Moxley will wrestle full gear and he will beat him again. Cassie said he would take the power back. And Cassidy recalled Moxley talked about how Cassie was playing checkers while he was playing chess. Cassie said there were a couple pawns to get rid of. Cassie said he would face Yuta next week to root the pawn that lets him take the king. Yuta said no one's pawn. He's no one's pawn. And Moxley questioned whether Cassie would have the guts to pull the trigger. Moxley said, especially Cassie and anyone else who wants to take what he has is abandon all hope that the Death Riders is trying to make their exit to the crowd. But Darby Allen dove from the bow- balcony on the heels of a pink mask, and Allen threw punches at them. And then the Romero showed up, and they joined the fight, and the fight just kind of like abruptly stopped. Yeah. <laughs> All that stuff that they had a very awkward out. Yeah. And, and it's not just weird for TV. Another thing I read for the live crowd, they were kind of like, huh? It was just a weird ending. And I guess they just kind of trailed off and went backstage or whatever, or ended the fight. It's like, wait a minute. 
Well, so then, so of course, Darby has to take some vicious bumps. They cut the cameras back to Moxley, Sharif, Shafir, and Castagnoli entering the beginning of their truck. They started to drive away, but Alan, at Darby jumped at the bed of the truck. And Cassioli ran out, and Allen got into, ran into a cart, ran Allen into a garage door. Right? So then you declined the back of the truck, and the heels took off. When Allen, Allen, so instead of this resonating, Allen got, got back to his feet, and yelled, I'm still standing. So Jericho, Bill, and Keith are backstage. You know, the Ishii challenged Jericho to ring around our championship match in two weeks in Chicago. Jericho said he's at a soft spot for Ishii because they've known each other for 30 years. He said Ishii was his young boy. He used to get him coffee, carry his bags, and wash his back in the shower. That's pretty funny. He spoke about his classic match with Ishii in Chicago two years ago. And Jericho accepted the challenge and mentioned Jay, once again mentioned Jay Briscoe. And Keith said Jericho, it's away in the wind, he said. So they do... They do Britt Baker against Penelope Ford, okay? And I don't know why this match was taking place, but because I, I, I thought Penelope Ford was in an angle with somebody else. Like, I, I don't know. So, so Britt Baker wins, of course, in like nine minutes. And then Serena D walked out with her flag and had a stare down with, with Baker. That was her spot the show, Serena D. So Marina Sh- Shakira was interviewed backstage and was excited Brian Mays match with Anna Jay on collision. So she'd be drinking champagne. Then Harley Cameron showed up and took the champagne and slammed it. Both women end up shaking their... And a graphic listed that they'll be fighting each other on Saturday's collision. It's about the best way I could describe that. Yeah, and they kept it... Aggra- like, they would shake them aggressively at each other. And then... Right. I, mean, was... I don't know. <laughs> so, now mind you, Swerve is supposed to be wrestling... Bobby. Bash coming up, right? Yeah. Well, he's wrestling Leo Rush, and they're doing all these indie spots. Like acrobatics and stuff where you, you run at the guy, the guy steps out of the way like two or three steps before you get there and you just continue running straight like, like the guy has to, you're, like, you're running in a straight line and the guy moves and you continue running in a straight line like like forward like, like you miss the guy. Like, bro, th- those spots look so bad. Man, you know. So this is this was sort of doing a Leo Rush match when he should have just been that this kid. I, I don't know why he didn't. Yeah. So... So Swerve stunned the poison run and they hit the JML driver for the win. They delivered a post-match promo and spoke about how Leo Rush and Sheldon Benjamin tried to make names for themselves at his expense. And he spoke about facing Lashley full gear and the Swerve called him out. And the Hurt Syndicate played and Lashley and MVP walked on the stage. And MVP told Swerve he wanted to fight a member of the group. All he had to do was ask. MVP said they liked Swerve a lot and had his unrealized potential. MVP said one of the lessons they wanted to teach Swerve is that there's strength in numbers. Then Bobby and the Sheldon attacked Swerve from behind and Lashley went to ringside and joined in. And Lashley ran Swerve into the barricade. Then Benjamin backed not in the corner, and Lashley tossed Swerve inside the ring, and Benjamin put Swerve down the DDT, and then MVP uses Kane and told Nana while Lashley and Benjamin continued to work on Swerve. Lashley put Swerve in the full nose. The group of referees ran out, Lashley released a hold, and Nana checked on Swerve. What did you think about this? Is that where the promo was where a Swerve called Bridgeport Stamford and the whole crowd? Yeah. yeah. They couldn't They couldn't get the crowd back. They, they sent Tony out yeah. to try to correct it. Come on, Bridgeport, and all that. He got booed, right? Yeah, he got he got farted on. Yeah. yeah. But I but yeah, it's like you said, I, I don't if they're gonna set up Swerve for Lashley, they should add him basically money up. This was this was the opposite of that. So they they put all their production into Julia Hart videos because Renee Capet and Ken is interviewing Jamie Hayter and the Screaming of Black and another Julia Hart video aired and she was laying dead with blood in her shirt from the arrow in the last video and then Hart answered a phone call from Brody King who told her it was time to come home. And she put on her witch hat. The other thing I just hold on, let me pull it up because I meant to say it to Mark because he was asking about attendance. This is this sucks. So they ran this building in Bridgeport, Connecticut, right? Mm-hmm. In February of 2022, they sold nearly 6,000 tickets at this venue. A few okay. months later, in November, they were already down to 3,100, and last night they sold 2,700. Right. Compared to 6,000 a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, it's funny because, like, you know, it, it, bro, let, let me explain something. To, this is like everybody. There's a lot of terms in professional wrestling that people don't really, you know, that there there are unwritten rules to define these terms. Okay, but one of them Dave was arguing, talking about today, like the casual fan, and I don't think Dave understands what the casual fan is. Okay, because he was saying CMLL has casual fans because they literally shoot their, their TVs for for tourists. I said, well, then that would make like the the whole. TNA or Impact Zone tapings would, would be the exact same thing for casual fans, but that's but that's not what casual fans are. Yeah. If you just look at what the casual fan is, the casual fan is the is the fan that will watch it when the product is gets really good. Yeah. So so you know, like, but if they're putting enough content on that is getting enough buzz, 
people will start people that watch it don't watch it regularly okay will watch it as long as it's good and then when it's not good they'll stop watching it yeah. and then they'll hear it's good again they'll start watching it again and that that's the casual fan so you're never going to draw casual fans when your creative is not good right it's just, it just does not happen. It's just like, you know, these people, you're not drawing people that, that, that don't watch, that they're not habitual. There's, I'd say probably six. For Raw, there's probably like 1.2 to 1.3 million habitual yes. watchers of, 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 of WWE television. Yeah. That, like, if in a 52 week year, like in a calendar year, they might miss two or three shows. Yeah. But but they did at eight o'clock on or whatever time the, the show was on, they, they they tune in, you know. And it's like the, the, there's other people that do it too. But when the show's not good, they watch other things or, or don't or don't watch TV or play video games. Yeah. You know. So when the content's good, people people watch it. That's the casual fan. Yeah. So when people say you're, you know, you gotta you gotta look for the casual fan. You're saying, okay, well, you're, what, you're, the booking you're doing right now is not trying. So, like, none of the people watch you, not to get a casual fans, and you're booking for, like, uh, match quality and all this. When you get outside the box and start doing different types of content, like, you know, like story, storyline or cinematic or anything, that's when you start gaining new fans. Yeah, you know? So, once a company has a stake on it, like, for instance, if WWE is coming to Philly, I mean, they're, they're high now. But even when, you know, colder some people, they just hear the name WWE and they go, oh, I'll check that out, that's usually okay. You know, with AEW, it's like, hey, do you want to see AEW? And people go, oh, who's going to do this? AEW, I don't know, I heard that stinks. Who's going to be there? It doesn't seem to matter. You can say Jericho, MJF, Samoa Joe, Lashley, whatever, Moxley. And it's just, people just, I don't know, people don't want to go see it. TNA had that problem. I remember TNA was in Philly one year. The card on paper was unbelievable. It was like Hogan, Sting, Angle, Rude. Van Damme went in and they did the kill, you know, Dan right. and Styles. And it was in a smaller college building and it still didn't sell out. It right. really for pro wrestling, you know, and it's just like TNA had a stink on it at the time. And it's, it was very difficult to get out of that. And AEW, you know, guys like Meltzer and stuff would say, you know, you can't just throw a hell man and fix everything. You've got to book slowly and build the audience back up. I think AEW is kind of scary. I don't think, I mean, not that they're going anywhere, but they can't take their time right now. Stuck in the mud. We'll see what happens next week. Uh, going into the full, because bro, the full gear, like the card, does not even does not look impressive at all. No, no I was looking. Before. Like, like, yeah, like dark, you know, Orange Cassie against Moxley. Is that, is that the main event? Yeah, yeah. It's a shame because even <laughs> like disinterested. Whenever we review the pay per view cards on here, I'm like, oh okay, yeah, I'll check that out. That looks alright. I don't feel that way about full gear. Really. Yeah. You know, it's uh, what, is, what is Cage supposed to catch in his, his thing? He's been carrying that thing around. He's not. He's not even like in the title picture at all. Well, maybe 
maybe you just spoiled it for yourself. You never know. Maybe, I maybe actually, he does. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, Moxley, Cassidy, Fletcher, Osprey, Perry Garcia, Swerve, and Bobby, Mercedes, and Statlander, and Big Tag, yes, and then Jay White, yeah. and Page, and Jeff Strong, and then Jimmy versus the Big Room and AJ. Oh, the AJ, the Big Room. The TikTok star, the Big Costco. Costco guy, guy yeah. That's, good. That's I, on the pay per view? It looks like a great show. Uh, I, as I said this before, at least, you know, I'm glad he's in there to make some of it, but at the same time, I don't think that's exactly what he wants to do. It's on the card, really. Yeah, there's 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 trust in but that's, I don't know. Nobody's, going, nobody's watching the cosmic guy. Right. So that's been our dynamite, or AWD for a few. Enjoy the rest of the show. Yo, what's up? I just want to thank you guys for watching this clip. Don't forget to hit the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. And join our YouTube membership for hours and hours of exclusive, unedited. Un